In this video, we're going to talk about finding your artistic style. I've created a blueprint of how to achieve that, and if you stick around, you'll find out how. The first question I'd like to pose to you is, can your style be found? Now think about this for a second. Is your style something that you're going to find? Kind of. You have to look out there in order to find it. But your style, how you draw, is similar to your signature. It's inside of you. There's something naturally inside of you, the way you hold a pen, the way you see the world, that's going to come out from yourself and from your practice in the arts. However, it is important to look out. Without looking out at the world and without looking at other artists, you're not going to be able to find what resonates with you. Oftentimes I get students that come in and they pick the first thing that they see in some magazine as something they want to learn how to do. They see like one illustration or they see one painting and they think, I want to paint like this. And that's fine. However, many times during the first day of my classes, as anybody knows who's been in my classes, we go to the library and we spend the whole day just picking out books in the library. Because one really simple thing about a great art library is, you know, everything is divided into sections. So you can have a French Renaissance section, or you can have all the German painters in one section. And you can find similarities between them, and you can easily find other books that are in similar styles um, as other artists that you might be interested in. Let's think about this word style for a second. The word style is kind of an annoying word and an annoying term. I know what you mean, I know what people mean by it, but can you imagine saying, I want to learn to paint in Da Vinci's style? Like Da Vinci was like, you know, thinking about this in his head, like, oh, I really want to paint in this style. The paintings Da Vinci made came out naturally from him. So approach finding your own style in a similar way where you're looking out at the world, you're processing it, you're letting it come through you, and then it's coming back out onto the canvas. Here's the first thing you need to do in order to find your style. You have to find out what resonates with you. I like to using the term resonate because it's something kind of ethereal and hard to pin down, but certain paintings are gonna to speak to you more than other paintings. So just view the art. You don't need to read about the art or read about the artist or what they're trying to do at this point. Just view it. Imagine it like you're just listening to music. You're looking at the painting itself. And does this resonate or does this not resonate with me? It's the same way with music. Some people like rock music. Some people like country music. Different types of musical genres resonate with different people. So your first step is to go out and look. Look as much as you can. Go into Wikipedia and then click all the other artists associated with certain movements uh, throughout history and just hop around all these different Wikipedia pages. Or even better yet, if you have a library in your community, go to the library and look at all the different art books. And I think art books are really important in a lot of other ways uh, because you get a lot of artists' images in one single place, which on the internet, you can type in Da Vinci, and then you get like 20, you know, um, Last Supper paintings or something like this. A book is really nice because it gives you a lot of different images from that artist, and it gives you a little bit of information, it gives you some details, all these sorts of things. So step one, look at the world and find out what resonates with you. Now that you've found the artist which resonates with you, I want you to look at three key things in their paintings. The first thing is subject. What is the subject? I can't tell you how many times students ignore this very simple aspect to the paintings and drawings they like. What are they painting? Paintings have a big umbrella of similar subjects which they are about. They are generally portraiture, landscapes, interiors, um, you know, abstract painting. You know, there's all different types of subjects which can be painted. So let's say you want to do a drawing of your partner in their house. Well, that's actually part of a greater movement of people simply doing interior paintings. So identify what is the subject that your artist or group of artists 
were interested in that resonated with you and identify that subject and think, oh, it's landscape. I want to do landscapes. It's very easy, step one, often forgotten. I want to do portraits. Okay, there's a lot of different types of portraits that you can choose from. So identify what is the subject in the paintings that resonate with you the most. The next thing is the medium. So when we talk about the medium, what is it made out of? Is it done in acrylics? Is it done in oils? Is it done in watercolors? So many times students skip this very simple step and they just aren't using the same mediums and you can't get the same luscious glow and transparency of oils with acrylics. Certainly not when you start. Maybe there's a few people that can you know, use glazing and stuff like this. But in general, you're not going to achieve the effect of an oil painting using acrylics. You're certainly not going to achieve the effects of watercolor uh, with enamel paint, for instance, right? So think about the medium. What are these paintings made of? And another good thing about books, you look in the bottom, you get in the description, and it says, you know, enamel on aluminum. Oh, I wonder what that aluminum did with the enamel that made it react in that way. So oftentimes you get clues about how this painting is constructed simply by looking at the medium. So the second step is identify the medium. Uh, the third step is one I like to call the recipe. So what is the recipe for the painting? And by recipe, I mean all the different ingredients, all the different components, and this includes speed. You know, how fast was it painted? You know, was this painted very quickly or was this painted in stages? Like a Flemish, uh, you know, seven layer technique or something like this. Was this painted with black and white first and then they glazed on top of it and then they pushed the darks and brought the highlights out? Or was this painted, you know, all at once very, very quickly like a Willem de Kooning painting in oils with very, very thick paint? And coming to my next one is thickness in the recipe. How thick is the paint? Is this paint being applied very thickly? Is this paint being applied very thinly? How is the paint applied, right? The next one after that is color. What types of color are used in the painting? And then you have to you know, put on your detective hat a little bit and you have to find out what were the paint, uh, what were the colors that the artist was using to achieve these colors. Sometimes you're not gonna be able to achieve the same colors with the, you know, the paint that you have. So look into the artist as much as you can, try to figure out what their palette was, and then recreate that palette of colors before you begin. Another, another thing which is really important is what were the preparatory stages of the painting? Many times before paintings are made, there's a bunch of sketches made of them, right? Or alternatively, a lot of artists now, and in the past as well, use models uh, for their paintings. So I know an artist here in Czech Republic and he does uh, cutouts of paper, and he puts all these cutouts of paper, and then he lights them nicely, and then he takes photos of these like little paper cutout uh, sculptures that he makes, and then he paints from those models. So a lot of times the painting in the end point, we don't see that reference photo. We don't see the sculpture that came before it. We don't see the preparatory drawing. We don't see the, the 20 sketches maybe, if it's a you know more of a realist painter. Um, Think about what happens before the painting begins, before that you know, brush goes into the paint thinner and dives into some colors and, and splots onto the canvas. What comes before that? What are the preparatory stages? Identify those preparatory stages in order to get to that point when you start the painting that you feel well. Think about it this way. If this is your favorite artist, they've practiced a lot, they've done this thing, painting, quite a lot and they still need these preparatory stages in order to make their final project product. So think about how important are these preparatory stages and take the time to create those preparatory stages as well. Another really, really simple one is size. I can't tell you how many times this has happened to me. I get somebody coming into my classes and they want to do photorealism. And every time they want to do a photorealistic painting, I say, you should paint it big, right? This is step one of how to paint something photorealistically. Make it big. 
it's easier to paint something photorealistically bigger than smaller. It's very straightforward um, that <clears throat> working with tiny little brushes in a magnifying, magnifying glass isn't the best route uh, and it's going to give you back problems probably, although there are some nice miniatures. Anyway, think about the size. How does the size affect the painting? You know, I like Ralph Steadman a lot. Yeah, you can look at some of his images. He was one of the first artists that really got me excited about making art when I was in high school. And my paintings kind of have some of that quickness and that speed with them, them still in a completely different way. But his paintings and drawings, they're about like this big, you know? And this gives you a very easy range of movement, you know, with brushes very quickly, you know, rather than this. This is a different movement than this, right? So the size is going to affect how you move your hand, how you interact with that page. Identify, again, in the book, should be written right there at the bottom, how big is this thing? And you might be surprised when you look at some of these photorealistic paintings and find out that they're three meters by three meters, you know, or like eight by eight feet, nine by nine feet or so. So think about the size of the work and, um, and how that's gonna affect the painting as well. So then you've got your three things, which is subject, medium, and recipe. So write down those three things. What is the subject of all these things? What is the medium? And then what is the re recipe? So recipe is speed, thickness, color, preparatory uh, images or preparatory stages, and size. It's very simple. You look at it, you print out those images. I can't stress this enough. Print out the image, no matter how big your tablet is. Um, you might have a reference photo on your tablet or something like that if you're using one. But print out these images and put them up near your painting when you're painting. You're not just copying, you're not trying to emulate. That is what you're looking at. That's what your resonates with you. That's the type of art that's going to inspire you. Print those out and put them on your wall. Put, out, put as many as you can on your wall. You know, get a cork board and fill it up with those images. And then here's the thing. When you're done with your painting, and I've done this with students, and it's, it's almost unfair because it brings them to reality very, very quickly. Um, sometimes when we're working on a painting, we get caught up in the painting itself, and we kind of block out everything else, and we just zone out into that painting. Put the image of the artist which resonates with you, put that image right next to your painting, and look at them together. And then think about, what did I do right that I like? What did I do wrong? What did I kind of ignore, you know? And give yourself an honest critique of how you see these two comparing within that similar uh, realm of art that resonates with you and that you want to create. So print out the images, put them next to your painting, and immediately you're going to be like, whoa, okay, I need to improve this, this, and this. It could be something very simple. I need to improve my drawing. You know, my proportions are off. Take note of that, yeah? It's, it's not something where often in art schools, they, they throw you into this class and um, everybody is kind of like, well, you're just gonna find your way. You know, they're all just gonna find their style. It's just, you know, inside of them. No, everybody looks at other artists. You know, there's a reason Picasso loved Velasquez, for instance, right? Painters look at other painters all the time and you're really do, doing a disservice to your students if you're a teacher that doesn't allow them to, to have the breadth of all of art history and take that into account when, when creating their own works. Because we live in this culture at the moment where we think things just kind of bubble up out of nowhere and that artists are geniuses and these things just boop, right? Just pop up. But everything is related to something that came before in some way. And some artist inspired people uh, to create paintings. You know, here's what's on my easel right now, right? I did this kind of psychedelic painting of a cow. Um, probably a paint on my hand now. But that doesn't look like Ralph Steadman. But Ralph Steadman got me to this in some ways because Ralph Steadman got me interested in drawing, which got me interested in painting later on. So find the artist that resonates with you, uh, find out the subject, then create the recipe. How do they make a painting? and print out their images, put them next to your paintings, and you're going to be on the pathway to success. I wish you all the best. Thank you for watching.